we are on camera. Today is Friday, September 13th, 2019, and my name is Kurt Mueller. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Sue Verhoff, the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. John Butler, who served in the Vietnam War during 1970 to 71. John's oral history will, is going to be recorded for the Atlanta History Center's History Project in partnership with the Library of Congress. We're honored to have you with us today, John, and thank you for participating in this project. To begin with, please state your full name and date of birth. My name is John Charles Butler, and I was born December the 10th, 1945, in Pittsburgh, Kansas. My um, father worked on the railroad for 36 years, but all of his brothers and my mother's brothers all served in World War II. And our home was a very conservative, hardworking home and family, and it just never occurred to us that we would do anything but whatever our duty was when it was time to do it. And so as I went through school and high school, I knew I was going to go to college. And early on, after I graduated from high school in 1963 and started college, uh, the Vietnam War was heating up. And in my heart, I knew I was going to go to Vietnam. So as a sophomore, I made the decision to um, go ahead and go through advanced ROTC. I went through ROTC in, in fit freshman and sophomore years, because at the time, that was required anyway. And so I went through advanced ROTC. I was a member of Scabbard and Blade, which is an honor society for uh, ROTC cadets. And we had uh, some extra training and um, things we needed to do. Um, and um, when I graduated, I actually had a few hours toward my master's degree. And so um, I got my commission and um, asked for time to finish my master's degree, actually just to work on it. I didn't expect to get enough time to actually finish it. And the Army gave it to me. And so um, I finished my master's degree, went on active duty in February of 2068, I'm sorry, 2070. And my first assignment was Fort Sill, Oklahoma at the officer basic course. I was commissioned as a field artillery second lieutenant. And it was a 13 week course in Fort Sill. It was very interesting um, because there were three different f types of work that you did as an artillery officer. One was the guns themselves, one was uh, forward observer type work, and also uh, fire direction, which was pretty complicated at the time. And having a master's degree in math was actually pretty helpful for me to do that. Um, and I found it to be very interesting. Uh, I was married at the time. <clears throat> and our first child was on her way, um, and um, about that time, my uh, ex-wife now, her father died suddenly, and so as I was getting ready to go on active duty, I called, that's the only way to communicate at that time, I called the Department of the Army, Field Artillery Branch in Washington, D.C., and talked to a major, don't remember his name, and told him <laughs> what my dilemma was, that uh, I was getting ready to leave, um, by the way, my orders, surprisingly, were for Germany which I was not prepared for. I was prepared to go to Vietnam. I was prepared to go to a stateside assignment and then Vietnam or straight to Vietnam. I was not prepared to go to Germany. So as we're scrambling to prepare for that change in direction, my father-in-law passed away, uh, who I was very close to. And so I called and asked you know, what my options were. And he asked, he gave me an extra week to take care of the personal matters there but assured me that I could go to Germany and be there a minimum of nine months, or I could go to Fort, uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, which is close to where I lived, and be there for a minimum of nine months. We had several options, and we decided that I would go ahead and go to Germany. Uh, my wife would have the child, and she would come to Germany to meet me. So that's what we did. Went to Germany um, about 30 days after I arrived in Germany. I got happy news <coughs> and had orders for Vietnam. Uh, which was the same week I got notice that our child had been born, uh, Julie, who's now, uh, well, it doesn't matter. She's, she's a mother. She's wonderful. Um, and so um, it took a couple of weeks to process out. By that time, I had already bought a new car, a Volkswagen. Everybody bought a Volkswagen. I bought a Volkswagen. I uh, had to hurry up and ship it home. 
um, which I did. Um, and we had about a week at home, and then I went to Fort Lewis, Washington uh, for processing with all of my gear, my boots, my greens. I don't think I took my dress blues, which I bought, which I never wore one time. And as soon as I got there, they said, here are all these boxes. Put all of your uniforms, all of your boots, everything in these boxes. We're going to ship them home because they're going to issue me jungle fatigues and jungle boots and all that stuff. And it was in um, October, and it was cold in Fort Lewis, Washington. So the acclimation I had intentionally tried to do to be ready for hot weather was ruined by a week or two in Fort Lewis. And so uh, with f jungle fatigues on, which breathed all that cold air, um, we were shown a demonstration of an M16, but I never fired one. I actually qualified years before on an M1, ancient M1 rifle, that was so bad that the um, the um, I'm sorry the uh, where does a round go? In, it's, the chamber. The chamber. I'm sorry. The chamber was so pitted that, and we were in like a a concrete tube in the ground, and we were standing in that, firing out of it. And the, each round would freeze in the chamber because the chamber was so pitted that I would have to bring the rifle down inside the tube and use my boot to eject the round and put a live round in, which of course I'm staring down a muzzle of the live rifle as I pull it up. I did qualify, but it, that was distracting. It was very difficult to qualify with that, with that kind of distraction going on. Um, so anyway, so back to Fort Lewis. Um, out of Fort Lewis, we flew to Anchorage, Alaska, and then to um, Japan, and then to Vietnam. Um, most likely, as I recall, it was Benoit, the, the receiving station. We were told we were given a place to stay for a day or so, and while we were getting our assignments worked out, and somebody there that seemed to know what he was talking about said, you're probably going to be a forward observer since you're a field artillery lieutenant but you don't want to go to the 11th Armored Cav because they're always in trouble. They're always looking for, for contact. So if you're going to be a forward observer, hopefully you'll be with another unit. So sure enough, I got orders to be a forward observer with the 11th Armored Cav, um, which was my dream. Um, let me rewind a second and say that from the time that I was in college, especially after I went through OTC, I knew I was going to Vietnam. I knew before I went into ROTC. And there was a quality of life issue that I remember vividly. That if I was happy, if there was something really good going on, in the pit of my stomach, I remembered, yes, but I'm going to be going to Vietnam. And I did not want to go, but it was the only choice. It was the only option for me. It never occurred to me not to follow through on what I consider to be my duty as an American citizen. Um, and it, it was befuddling to me that other people would avoid it because it just seemed like that was what you did. Um, so that nagging concern at various levels stayed with me. Even in Germany, I thought, well, maybe I'm not going to have to go, but maybe I am. And then I got the orders, and it was, um, it was frightening. Um, so I go to Vietnam, and the first night there, um, we got incoming in the camp that I was in, and that was scary. Um, and then uh, we got orders to be a forward observer with the 11 Cav, 11th Armored Cav, and that was scary. Um, but uh, my mom was home praying for me, I knew she was, and uh, one way or the other I knew I'd get through it. I wasn't sure if I'd make it or not. Um, I always wondered if I was going to make it. <coughs> So the, um, they transferred me via bus through Saigon, as I recall, to Xeon, which was the base camp of the 11th Armored Cav. Um, and there were few, very few people there, all of the units. I was assigned to, the, to A Troop of the 1st Battalion of the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. And they were, as all of the company-sized troop, they call them, units were, independently deployed in different places. So I was able to get a ride 
<clears throat> in a Jeep with a trailer with some other guys <clears throat> to where my unit was, uh, to near where my unit was. Um, interesting story, we were on, I think it was Highway 1, I don't know, it was a highway, it was a two-lane paved road. The driver was, I believe, a Spec 5. I don't think he ever really got a driver's license, but somehow he was our <coughs> driver. We were behind a, a Korean army, a ROC they call them, Republic of Korea, a deuce and a, deuce and a quarter, deuce and a half, uh, with full of Korean soldiers. And there are four of us in this Jeep. I'm in the back right side. And our, it was a trailer with our duffel bag with all of our gear in it. So we're driving down this highway, and our driver decides to pass this truck. And he gets about halfway around the truck, and the truck decides to pass the car in front of it. So the driver, rather than putting his brakes on, just rolls over onto the left shoulder. And we're still going full speed, whatever that speed is, without slowing down. And there's this huge pile of rocks coming up, coming up on us fast. And we're not going to be able to get around this pile of rocks or go over it. So the driver, again, rather than slowing down, decides to go back into the lane where the truck still is. And I remember the tire of that truck coming up within a few inches of my face as we embraced the tire of that truck, which caused the Jeep to go out of control. The Jeep was turning one way, the trailer another, and the driver did exactly the opposite of what you would do when that happens, which caused the problem to exacerbate until the, the trailer left us back in the highway somewhere. All of our gear was strewn along. We ended up going backwards into the ditch on my side, slamming into the, to the uh, ditch on the side there. Everybody escaped without injury, thank God. Um, it was terrifying. And I thought, is this the way I'm going to die <laughs> in Vietnam? Is in a stupid car accident? Um, but we got all together, got our stuff together, we joined our unit. Um, the way we joined our unit is the, I was the forward observer, I had a track uh, with four guys that, that were my team, and they came to meet me at a, uh, a, a place that was predefined on the road. Um, I arrived with um, my gear, uh, we spent the night there, and then we joined the rest of our unit the next morning. When we joined the unit, um, one of the first things I remember is we pulled in and I heard some guys cheering, Buick, Buick, Buick. And I thought, what is that? It turns out one of the guys was sick and was throwing up and they were cheering him on, calling out Buick. And I thought, well, this is an interesting bunch right here. And that was an interesting group. Um, turned out these guys were, uh, none of them really wanted to be there that I could tell, but they really cared about each other. Um, I was 25. Uh, the rest of the guys in my unit, uh, on my vehicle, there was a Spec 5, uh, there was a driver, he was a TC, they called it, track commander, a driver, and then two gunners on either side where I sat in the middle. Uh, they, were all, they were all teenagers, they were all just kids. Um, but when we went into contact or when we were on a patrol uh, and we did what we call reconnaissance in force where we would make quite a scene, um, it, was quite, quite, it was quite comforting really to be uh, part of a unit with that much firepower uh, when we went on to missions. Now we did do some dismounts uh, where we walked, uh, that was not as much fun. Uh, we did a few patrols. We were just one or two track vehicles. That was not as much fun. But when we were in mass, it was it was pretty uh, gratifying to know there was a bunch of uh, a bunch of other support around us, and the guys really cared about serving together and helping each other, um, even if they didn't want to be there. And that was very very helpful, grat gratifying to me. Uh, one of the missions that stands out is we spent about <clears throat> I think it's about six weeks on a mission to protect. Um, a company-sized unit of Rome plows. A Rome plow is a D7 or D9 Caterpillar bulldozer. Uh, they call it a Rome plow because it's a special blade on the front of that uh, Caterpillar that's actually made and was made in Rome, Georgia, and it was designed specifically to clear jungle. It had a stinger on one edge of it and they would stick it in the tree if the tree was too big just to push over, 
and split the tree in half and then hit it again face on and it would knock the tree down. So uh, we, our mission was to clear a path um, about 100 yards wide, as I recall, through fairly dense jungle that at one time had, at one time had, 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 had a road in it. And so we were really defining the road. Um, and um, so for the most part, we, we made the road where the map showed the road would be. There was really no other indication where the road actually was. Um, and so we, pa we cleared a path and our, our vehicles, our tracked vehicles, our armored cavalry assault vehicles, they call them, would go along and, and uh, space out along where the plows were working to keep them safe. And we would stay in a, an NDP, a night defensive position, for three to five days, uh, three to five nights uh, at a time, and then move to stay up with the plows. Um, the plows would build up a berm all the way around our perimeter, pretty good sized perimeter, because a couple of hundred guys uh, stayed there. Uh, the vehicles, all the vehicles were in the middle of it. They would do maintenance at night. Um, we would, uh, the, the armored cab guys would, would form the perimeter with the vehicles facing outward um, up against the berm. Um, and so we, we did that for about six weeks or so. Um, we would, uh, one of the things we did that entertained us, um, and it was actually supposedly a mission value, I don't know, I think it was mostly to keep us awake, is we would have a med minute once or twice or three times a night where every vehicle would open up firing into the, firing out the perimeter with whatever uh, weaponry they wanted to fire. And it was maddening. That's why they call it a mad minute. I tried to record it on a, on a tape. I have no idea where the tape is now because uh, it was quite an experience. And as I said, it was comforting actually to know that there was that much firepower at our call. The uh, enemy contact we had, probably, probably most, mostly because we had so much firepower at our disposal, was um, uh, what they call H&I, or harassing interdictory fires, where mortars or rockets would come in, uh, especially at night when we were trying to sleep, uh, into our uh, perimeter. So um, that was the majority of that. We did spend one, um, <coughs> one, uh, one, one of the last NDPs, <coughs> excuse me, we, uh, we held or we um, lived on, or whatever you call it, were, were positioned at, uh, was Hill 562. It was a very high p point, a very high peak. It was higher than any other surrounding area for many miles. And it had recently been uh, um, um, occupied by the NBA. And the reason we knew that is we, there was a lot of equipment still there. There were tons of, not literally necessarily, but a lot of 20 millimeter casings from airstrikes that had been, uh, air, U.S. airstrikes that had been uh, engaged there. Um, so we stayed on that for a few days. That was kind of the end of our, uh, as I recall, that was the last night defensive position that where we, we stayed. Um, it was Christmas when we got there. We knew Christmas was coming and all of us had mixed emotions about how this was going to be and we decided with great bravado that we would plan to have, and we did, uh, create a giant uh, Christmas tree in the air using handheld rockets, uh, handheld flares is really what they were. And so we started collecting for a few days. We even had our supply helicopter bring us some uh, and pulling together our red, uh, white, I think green, maybe yellow, um, uh, handheld um, signal flares. And then at midnight, we had a rear uh, supply position back in Song Bay. Uh, we radioed them and told them uh, to look, uh, look our direction around midnight. And sure enough, at midnight, we all hit the flares. They went up in the air, and the Song Bay told us, yes, it looked like a huge Christmas tree in the air hanging over our position. So that was very gratifying. We felt really good about that. Um, and of course, we stayed. We lived in these armored personnel carriers. There was a box, a metal box, and we um, we lived in those. We we slept in those at night. Um, and um, and somebody always had Armed Forces Vietnam radio on AFVN, AFVR, or whatever they call it, the radio station that was for GIs. And it was about, as I said, midnight when we when we launched all these when we made this Christmas tree. 
and after that we um, someone was the radio was playing it was dark it's pitch black the excitement was over and the song comes on the radio I'll be home for Christmas and each one of us one at a time kind of went off on our own <laughs> And dealt with that. That was I'll never forget. Every time I hear that song, I think about Hill uh, 562. So anyway, um, that was our last mission. That, I, that I'm pretty sure that was our last mission um, before the unit, the 11th Armored Cav, stood down, which means we went back to ultimately back to Zeon and started decommissioning or cleaning up our vehicles and our equipment, turning it in, which apparently was turned over to the Arvins. Um, and um, um, then um, we, uh, then I was reassigned. It was about six months, about halfway through my tour. And the uh, but the um, battalion S1, who I think was a captain, um, said, "I'm going to do you a real favor. I'm going to reassign you to the um, uh, to a heavy artillery battalion." up in Military Region 1, up near Da Nang, because they've got concrete side. You've been living in the jungle this whole time. they got concrete sidewalks. they got hot showers. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. So, okay, so I'll do that. And by the way, uh, well, I won't go into that. Yeah, I'll tell you why. What, the way we slept in those vehicles, those armored cavalry assault vehicles, is we had mini cans, they call them, 50 caliber uh, artillery, uh, 50 caliber ammunition cans that were about 18 inches wide, flat on the top. We'd line each side of the inside of the vehicle with that, and then the floor was plywood over the, you know, and then there was a line, there was a, a tray of 50 caliber cans across the front, which was not as wide as the length. So I slept on one of the rows of 50 caliber, 50, of, of mini cans. One of the other guys slept on another row. The TC, who was a Spec 5, we gave him the honor of sleeping on the floor because that was the most room. And then the, uh, our driver was a kind of a short guy. His name was Felix. I don't know what his real name was. That's all I remember today is his name was Felix. He slept on the, on the 50 caliber cans across the front. And the only way to sleep was to, you could not put your arms to your side. You couldn't lay on your side. You couldn't lay on your stomach. You could lay on your back if you crossed your legs and crossed your arms over your chest like a corpse. And that was the way I learned to sleep and it was fine. And for years after I got home, that was the only way I could go to sleep <laughs> is, to, <laughs> is to sleep like that with my, uh, my legs and arms crossed. Uh, and another sidebar as it would, is, is when we knew we were going into contact with the 11th Cav, um, there was a lot of dark humor. Uh, that we used to help uh, mitigate the fear that we all felt, whether we admitted it or not. And I'll never forget the first time I've heard it. I heard it was that someone started singing, you're getting ready to go into a contact, and s someone started singing, you're going home in a body bag, do da, do da, and everybody started singing. And it, you know, thinking back on it, it's kind of sick, but it was very distracting, as I said, and it was a, um, a way to just process that. So. So anyway, I got reassigned to the um, second of the 90, second of the, uh, see, I forget now that the unit, unit, unit nomenclature, it was a heavy artillery battalion. And sure enough, it was headquartered in Da Nang. And I arrived, um, nobody was there. I so they had for concrete sidewalks, and they had a big outdoor shower area, but nobody was there. And I went to the headquarters building, and our battalion S3 was a major, and he was there. And he greeted me and welcomed me. And I said, Major, I said, where is everybody? And he said, let me show you. And they showed a map on the wall, a uh, huge map, probably six, eight feet from set side to side, which was the entire uh, DMZ from Laos to the Gulf. And it was, um, he said, we are right here. And he pointed to a spot right on the Laotian border, just about an inch below the DMZ. And I thought, holy shit, that's not what I said, but I said, well, what are we doing there? And well, we're in this operation, we're supporting um, uh, Arvin's insertion in Laos, and so we are as close to the ocean border as we can get because we're not allowed to go into, into Laos. And this is a unit that's, that had um, 
175 millimeter guns, which were um, the same chassis as an 8 inch howitzer, but it had a longer tube and it would fire about 100 pounds of powder. Uh, the projectile was about 175 pounds and it would go 25 miles and it was huge. Um, so each battery had four of these big guns and I was assigned to be the battalion fire direction officer since I was at that point a first lieutenant, wow wow. Um, so I got out to the unit, our battalion fire direction center was in the middle of one of the firing batteries. Um, and so the battalion fire direction center consisted of a radio truck, it was like a five ton truck with a big van, um, and there were multiple radios in there. And the battalion fire direction center had radio contact um, charts and uh, we had a FADAC, they call it a field artillery, field artillery digital automatic computer or something weird like that, very peculiar, huge thing. Um, that we would calculate firing data, and we would calculate the firing data. The, the battery uh, direct fire direction centers would also calculate firing data, and we would confirm the firing data to make sure we had correct firing data. Um, so our my team was in the van on the radios, and um, I mostly sat outside the van um, in the ditch. The ditch, the the the, tra the truck was. Um, essentially buried in a ditch that was dug by a bulldozer deep enough the top of the truck was level with the ground and then we would have we had these huge wooden beams that went across the top of the van and then uh, covered it with sandbags and everything so it was protect the van the van was basically underground um, so this at this point the the um, the uh, sp 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 esprit de corps was non-existent. Um, these guys did not want to be there. They did not care whether you whether they followed instructions or orders. Um, the guys in the guns did their work, uh, and then at night um, they didn't care whether they slept or not for um, guard duty. Uh, and that was that was actually the scaredest, the most scared I was is being there. We were so close. We did get incoming from NVA artillery apparently. Because uh, we were so close, um, we had um, uh, Air Force uh, jets come in sometimes to try to dislodge the artillery because apparently they were positioned in the side of mountains and we couldn't reach them with artillery. Um, and um, I remember seeing them flying over. Sometimes you could count the rivets, and I thought I'd rather be there than here. Maybe not, but um, anyway. Um, it was frightening to be there because the guys, mostly because they didn't care. Um, I had guard duty periodically and would walk the perimeter and it was not unusual to find guys asleep in their foxhole. Um, and it was kind of scary. Um, we were supported <coughs> by, oddly enough, an air defense artillery battery which consisted of two quad 50 trucks and two dusters. And the duster is, looks like a tank with twin barrels and it fired, I believe it was 40 millimeter exploding rounds. Um, they were designed for air defense but they made a hell of a perimeter defense. And the quad 50s was again four 50 caliber machine guns mounted on the back of a five ton truck facing toward the back. Uh, that were synchronized, so when they fired, it was awesome. Um, <coughs> but the crews of those, for whatever stupid reason, had been racially divided. So there was um, a crew of one race, a different crew of a different race, and a different crew of a different race, and they did not communicate with each other, they did not care for each other, um, and um, I'm not sure they were actually helpful for them to be there. Um, one night I was walking, they were typically, we, we, we positioned them, we stayed in that same position for a long time. I actually, I actually another lieutenant and I dug our own um, trench to sleep in. We dug a Y-shaped trench for us to get down under the ground level and, and, um, and uh, dug it deep enough where we could put a, a cot uh, 
with the edges right next to the edge of the trench and the and we uh, ha hollowed out underneath the cot so the cot was about an inch off of the ground and we could sleep under there um, but um, um, but anyway, I, I digress. I was walking the perimeter one night, and the oh, I know the the the, the four uh, field artillery ba uh, crews were positioned at the strategically most vulnerable points of our perimeter, which is an, again another concern. But the quad fifty truck was out uh, at the end of a kind of a point of land. It was probably it's hard to remember twenty or thirty yards. Uh, a little d diversion in the regular, it's not a round perimeter. So I was walking out toward the truck, and there's a bit of a breeze behind, coming from behind my back, and the crew was in the tr cab of the truck, which faces the middle of the perimeter. Uh, already a bad sign. So one of the guys gets out of the truck and walks to the front of the truck, and I hear the unmistakable round uh, sound of an M16 round being jacked into the chamber. And he's standing there, and I hollered, I hollered out. I said, I said, uh, what's up? Or I forgot what I said, except that he yeah, identified myself. And he said, well, he said, I called, a, I called for the challenge, and you didn't respond with a password. I said, well, who the hell do you think I was? He said, well, I couldn't tell. You know, So they were a troublemaker. So I think they were smoking pot in the cab of that truck, but I'm not sure. And then um, a few nights later, our our battalion commander, his his he had a tent <coughs> set up in the middle of the perimeter, in the middle of, of the position of the fire base, and had sandbags up about three five, uh, three feet or so all the way around it. And um, a few nights later, um, there was an explosion, and it was a M79 grenade went off in the sandbags of his tent, and it came from the direction of that crew. And coincidentally, that crew disappeared uh, a few days, a day or so later. I don't know where they went, but uh, we were relieved it, that they left. Um, so, um, as I said, it was a frightening time because uh, we could not count on each other, as we could have, as we were able to do when I was with the 11th Cav. Um, so when we finally finished that, uh, that the mission was called Lamson 719. And it was an intentional invasion into Camb into Laos um, to try to uh, cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail and, and the Arvin units. Uh, apparently, uh, there was all kinds of issues that happened about that. At the time, I had no idea. Uh, I just knew that what we were supposed to do, we basically fired 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, not several rounds a minute, it's just that we were always firing on missions, uh, including the night. Um, one night, I was sitting in my little chair, and the a, whenever I had bought a, I think it was five dollars, a little uh, the cheapest um, lawn chair you've ever seen. The Vietnamese sold those, um, and I was sitting on the slope uh, next to the truck in the fire direction center below the ground, and um, there was a tremendous explosion. Every time the 175 went off. Uh, the sound, you never got used to how much noise it made. It was unbelievable. But this time it was different. There was a huge, more, even more loud sound, and the inside of our trench was suddenly filled with dirt and debris, and uh, we thought we had gotten incoming. And we started hearing some hollering, and we discovered that the breech of one of the 175 guns had exploded and it killed a couple of guys and wounded some others. And uh, we uh, needed to call in a medevac. It was a night. I frankly don't remember now whether medevac came that night or I, I honestly don't remember because it was our it was our fire direction center that called in the medevac. I just remember being scared to death, frankly. And then when we finally got things settled down, it may have been the next day. I re-examined what had happened, and I was where I was sitting. I noticed that there was a hole in the sandbags to my right, and another hole with a piece of metal sticking out of it on the sandbag to my left, and it was the breech bolt. It come through the sandbags, and I ran a little sight line and realized it had missed my head by maybe an inch. Um, so again, I think my mom was keeping me alive with her prayers. Um, 
but it was a frightening time uh, to be there. So uh, eventually, we uh, we broke down our equipment and came back um, and uh, were positioned in a the nicest facility I was in when I was in Vietnam. It was uh, near Phu Bai, between Phu Bai and Hue. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was adjacent to the 101st Airborne's rear headquarters. We had uh, plywood buildings. I had a room with a cot. I had a fan. Uh, I had a mosquito net. Pretty nice. I bought a used refrigerator that was about two foot by two foot by two foot, and someone had painted it yellow and wrote top secret on it. So I had the top secret refrigerator in my room, my little room, and we had hooch mates, and they would, uh, at that time, the battalion commander decided we needed to polish our boots. First time I'd ever had to do that. So they would wash our, our um, laundry for us and polish our boots, and we had a mess hall. We could eat a hot meal once or twice a day. Um, we had a, a very stylish um, canister that used to had had used had had one time held one seven five millimeter powder, turned and dug into the ground with a very classy screen on it, and that's what we could pee in, because we're no longer just peeing in the jungle; we're peeing in a civilized environment. So it was very classy. Um, the hooch maids used the concertina wire to drape our fatigues over them so they would dry. So that's where I spent the last um, uh, couple of months, I guess, of, of my tour was at Fubai, near Fubai. Um, the battalion commander, when it was about time for my year to be up, gave me the pep talk. And even though I now know they were drawing down, he must have known who I was or thought I was cool or something because he talked to me about staying in, and um, I said, Colonel, no offense, but my first assignment was to Germany, and four weeks later, I had orders for Vietnam, and two weeks later, a brand new second lieutenant from Fort Sill came to replace me. Any organization, no matter how big, that's that messed up on the way they treat their people, I have no interest in it whatsoever. Thank you very much. So I um, decided to leave when my 365 days, but who's counting? was up, um, <clears throat> and when I got my orders, <clears throat> I had four months of active duty left, <clears throat> but I was discharged. So I arrived in the United States unemployed with a, a child and uh, no idea uh, how to find a job, but I was so glad to be home. Um, Upon arrival, I was, um, I had read the news, but of course our news was filtered a bit. We, we read our, the, the Stars and Stripes. Um, it was about the only news we saw. Um, we weren't, I don't think, oblivious that there were, that there were trouble, there was trouble and, and protesters, but it, for some reason it didn't sink into me that it was real people, normal everyday people who actually despised soldiers until I landed in San Francisco. And that was a shock I was not prepared for. And I did not know how to process it. And um, I had seen a lot of hurt, death in Vietnam. And somehow I feel like I was able to process that because I was expecting that. I wasn't prepared to process the disdain that I felt. Um, and um, so the only, in retrospect, I, at the time, I just, I realized, I, at the time, I just didn't really know what to do, how to deal with it. Now I can look back on it and realize that what I actually did was to become emotionally unavailable. Um, whether or not, I mean, my, I have two older brothers and a younger sister, a mom and a dad who loved me. My, at the time, my grandma, my, gra my <coughs> grandma Butler, my dad's mother, who was precious to me. And she wrote me the most encouraging letters in Vietnam you can imagine. Um, we're all in my support system. And it probably was my fault, but I felt like 
we didn't know how to communicate about anything about this. We didn't talk about it. And I didn't necessarily feel ashamed, although I felt like there was shame that was assigned to me, but not by my family, but it was such an awkward, uh, it just was better not to even discuss it. So we just didn't talk about it. So for years, I, that's the choice I made. Um, again, looking back, uh, my ex-wife mentioned more times than I can count that she wanted a divorce, and I don't know, but I suspect it was because I was emotionally unconnected and unavailable. And so I, I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. I, I have, you know, now. Um, so um, we did uh, uh, get a divorce um, a few years after I got back from Vietnam, and um, I tried to figure out a way to be um, okay with being single. Um, finally got to the point where I could deal with that. Um, and, um, and then I met Susie, and um, we've been married 38 years, and she's the best thing, awesome, she's awesome. Um, I don't remember what year it was. I suspect it was after Susie and I met, but it may have been before, it may have been during that time when I was single and kind of lost. Um, I met a guy at a very peculiar event in southwest Missouri called Rendezvous. And a friend of mine invited me. We slept in a tent or a teepee. I think we slept in a teepee. And they had hatchet throwing contests and muzzle loading rifle shooting contests and all kinds of weird things. And we were sitting around the campfire one night and this guy had been a major, had, I'm sorry, had been a sergeant in uh, the Marines. And somehow it came up that I had served in Vietnam. And he, I can't think of his name, he expressed to me for the first time, at least that I can hear it, that I heard it, that he appreciated and it was an honor that I served and it was an honor to meet me. And I wasn't prepared for that either. But it was like, you know, maybe it is okay that I did that, you know. I didn't. I still didn't want to talk about it, but it, at least it was a it was an opening to a perspective that I just had not considered, and I remember it distinctly today. So, so let me let me back up a second. When I first got back from Vietnam, it was in October, and I didn't have a job, as I said, and um, I, I was fortunate enough to run into a, a chemical engineer in the small town I lived in who had created a way to uh, apply a polyurethane material for athletic surfaces on gymnasiums and outdoor tracks. And he hired me um, knowing it was a temporary position that I needed a job, a real job. He hired me to go around the, the four state area, Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and go to colleges and universities and meet with their athletic directors and so on about his product. And while I was on one of those trips, I was in Oklahoma City in a hotel, and a little blurb came on TV, and it said, Jobs for Veterans. And I quickly wrote it down uh, before, I, before it went away. And I called the next day, and they had one job opening for someone with computer experience or skills. And I got that job. Uh, it was in January. Um, and I started, it was a startup company. And um, that company, um, uh, was a startup in, Sh in Shawnee, Oklahoma, a little bedroom community near Oklahoma City. Uh, but it was a job, it was a real job, it was great. Um, and our daughter, uh, our second daughter, Jane, who was a beautiful, wonderful uh, daughter, was born in July of that same, <coughs> that year, <coughs> in Shawnee. And then about a month or two later, uh, the startup company went out of business. Um, but the mainframe company that we were using, it was a UNIVAC uh, mainframe, um, realized that I had gained about two years worth of experience in the nine months I worked for them, for this other company. And their uh, requirement was that you had two years of experience to be able to be considered to be hired. Uh, but they hired me. Um, and, and the reason I mention that right now is because um, I really 
uh, found that the work that I did was gratifying. The other issues in my life were uh, troubling, difficult, um, so I worked all the time. Um, and so uh, when Jane came along, I was not as well, not as connected as I should have been with her, I'm sure, and uh, neither my older daughter at that point was about just about two years old exactly. Um, so I don't know how good of a father I was. I was I was out a lot. I was working a lot. Uh, I would come home and eat dinner and go back to work. Um, so my uh, relationship with my daughters, I'm sure, suffered, and of course with my ex, uh, certainly must have suffered because of that as well. Um, so um, I, when I got home from Vietnam, I. Uh, it took a while to find my first job. I had a master's degree. would have been in computer science if the college had had a computer science degree at the time. My thesis was on computer-based stuff, but it was actually in applied mathematics. But um, I got a job working for um, a technology uh, inst uh, company, a mainframe company, and uh, poured myself into my work. I got a lot of gratification out of the work I did. I was first a technician. I say a technician. I was a software engineer. Um, and did um, a lot of fairly sophisticated programming and things, and then I became a sales guy and, and did that for a while and, and uh, went through about 25 years in the computer business um, um, and uh, was successful at that. Um, wasn't that successful in relationships, I don't think. Um, Susie was very tolerant of me. Uh, we ended up getting married, as I said, 38 years ago. Um, a few years, I think it was 10, after we were married, we actually went to a counselor and learned how to argue and fight, uh, which we didn't know how to, mostly because I was oblivious. Um, and little by little, over the past, really not that many years, I've uh, learned um, about um, PTSD, uh, the deep felt I don't know if the resentment is the right word, but the inability to respond appropriately to uh, emotional situations. Uh, Susie and I had a son, uh, have a son, he's, he's 29, almost 30, um, and our relationship, particularly in his teenage years, he and I uh, had a very, very uh, challenging relationship and much of it was and again it took me a while to look back on I can see looking back on it was my over responding over reaction to what should have been normal stimulus um, and it took some time to be able to uh, learn that and, and and to process that I did go to the VA uh, my cousin uh, who we were very close with all the way through school we as, as kids all the way through he's a Vietnam veteran he served ahead of me he was an infantry um, uh, enlisted guy, and uh, Phil um, hammered me for a long time to go to the VA and register with the VA uh, regarding Agent Orange exposure. And I said, why would I do that? And he said, well, you, just, you ought to do that. And so what triggered it actually is I needed hearing aids. And he said, you know, you ought to go to the hearing aid. I'll go to the VA, maybe they can give you hearing aids. So that's kind of what, what I did. Plus I had um, was diagnosed with prostate cancer about 16 years ago, and that was no fun, um, but um, um, he again kept challenging me that prostate cancer is a presumed diagnosis for Agent Orange exposure. I really need to go to the VA. So that's when I went to the VA finally, and that's actually, I think that's when I actually got my hearing aids, um, which was very, very helpful. But um, I did go uh, to one session with a shrink at the VA. Um, um, and I just didn't really want to do it anymore. Uh, but I, I felt like I, just being aware um, that there's at some level, um, and it wasn't that I wanted people to thank me. It wasn't that. It really was if, if I did something, especially if I extended myself to serve, to help somebody, and they threw it back in my face, it really affected me deeply. And that's kind of what I was feeling with my son. In retrospect, it was totally inappropriate for me. But I understand it now, and he and I have a good relationship, a great relationship now, but it was tough for a number of years. Um, so every now and then I'll get a trigger, and I'll say, oh, that's, that's that, got to watch that. Um, so um, I'm, um, 
I was in the parking lot of an office where I worked, and at that time I had gotten brave enough to put a, a little tag frame on my tags of the Vietnam veteran, and a guy from the AVVBA drove by. He opened his window and he said, are you a Vietnam veteran? I said, yes. He said, I want you to come to lunch with me. Uh, I have a meeting I want you to attend. I said, what is it? He says, it's Vietnam veterans. I said, I just really never had an interest in that. He said, I, I want you to come to lunch with me. Just come one time. And if you don't like it, don't go again. So I went and I met Kurt. I met um, a room full of normal people. And it was very cathartic to me to know that a Vietnam veteran could be a normal person, not like the news portrayed. And um, I've established some deep, deep uh, relationships, friendships <coughs> with the uh, with the folks from uh, the guys from the Vietnam from the AVVBA. And I, I say it's guys; almost all of them are guys because at that time there weren't that many women who served. So I'm very grateful for that. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my story, whether anybody's interested or not. So thank you. Well, you have really expounded on a number of great things and quite interesting of what you experienced. I'm going to go back into when you were in Vietnam and have you think through your number. You listed a number, indicated a number of situations. But is there one or two significant events that happened, in, uh, happened to you in Vietnam that made a significant impression on you that you think have maybe made an impact in your life today? Um. I don't know how to answer that. I watched a guy burn to death. I, I don't know how to, how to, I don't know what that, I don't know what to do with that. I saw a guy get his face burned off from a, a, an explosion in a fire of a blasting cap that was left in a backpack and he's permanently disfigured for his life. I carried a guy to a medevac with a hole in his head from a round. He was still alive. I don't know if he made it or not. Those are the things I have. When you, when you ask me about singular events, those come up, whether they affect my life today. What affects my life today the most is the, was, and thank God it's not now, is the unexpected treatment on my return. I just did, I could not get my head around that. Um, and it wasn't so much that people spit on me or anything. I just felt a sense of disdain for doing what I felt like was the honorable thing to do, doing my duty, not only for my country, but for my fellow soldiers. And to have that thrown back in my face affected me for years. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, and um, I can really appreciate what you're saying is that uh, we all know who has served in Vietnam, and we realize how precious life is, I think, today. Right. And um, especially when you're involved in combat situations and situations which we have no control over, and you see the repercussions of combat and how it impacts right. lives. And I, there was another second lieutenant came to join our, when I was with the CAV. He had just had his first child, and he was killed the first day, at least the first week he was there. And mm -hmm. I remember helping extract his body. It was like, this guy had everything to live for, and his, his life is over. And like you say, you realize, and uh, you know, life is precious, 
even in that environment, um, so there is a, there is something. Um, I'm not sure if I should say this on tape or not, but there is something uh, that I believe. If someone has served, God bless them if they've served in the military. They've they wrote the sake they wrote the same blank check I did. But there is something different about having served in combat, and where it is clear that your life and those li and the lives of people around you are at stake, there is something that does change the way you see things. And I am honored and pleased to thank anybody who has served. But I know from a few personal experiences that people who did not serve just don't see it the same way we do. If they, I mean, if they didn't serve in combat, it doesn't. That we're not. I'm not better than them. It's just a different. It's just a different perspective. At some deep level. Um, so I don't know if that is appropriate. You might want to cut that out. But I mean, that's 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 what I feel about it. No, I think that you, you, it's a good point. One other uh, thing that you mentioned. The, particularly the esprit de corps that you uh, saw and the camaraderie that you experienced when you were with the 11th Armored Cav down south in Zeon. You move up on the DMZ or uh, close to that area during Lums on 719 and with the the second, I think you said 94th Artillery. Uh, second of the 94th, fourth yes. Art battery. That's what it was, yeah. um, and you saw at that point in time uh, a real, I want to call it, lack of esprit de corps and where people, as I would call it, people were not looking out for each other. Right. And what do you think was the reason for that? Knowing the situation that your unit was involved in, because that Lamson 719 was considered probably one of the most biggest combats we faced that was, in some ways, was not successful in right. a lot of ways. Right. But we were, even though we weren't physically in Laos, we were up on the DMZ. Right. What do you think the cause you for know, that? You know, it's a very good question, and I don't know the answer. It wasn't because we weren't in danger, because we did. We got incoming. We were, we had people killed that would just be on a on a uh, in the you know maybe one one of our officers, a major, was going from one battery to another and got blown up in his jeep. I mean, it wasn't like we were not experiencing danger. Which was what I would have originally thought. That's what it was, because we were experiencing danger constantly with the 11th Armored Cat, or at least very, very frequently. We lived in the jungle, and we, and we experienced incoming, and we we went out. I mean, our our motto was find the bastards and pile on. I mean, we were looking for contact. Um, the second and 94th, we were in a defensive position, even though we were firing artillery into Laos. Um, we had contact with the NVA. We had artillery coming from the NVA. We, uh, there was a very real possibility we would get overrun, and yet the guys didn't care. I think, I'm guessing, they were smoking pot, maybe. I don't know. Because, mm -hmm. frankly, not long after we got back from that jungle, f that assignment, that, that location, back to uh, near Fubai, um, the... Um, the Army instituted a, um, um, I forgot what they call it, a, a grace period, not a grace period, a, a program where if you turned yourself in for drug use, you would be able to be treated and you could go home without a mark on your record if you voluntarily turned yourself in. Well, there were guys that I, I mean, I was, I was one of two at that point, fire direction officers. I, I worked 12 hours and the other guy worked the other 12 hours. So we were in a bunker. There were five guys in there. And we were became we came we were very close, and uh, a couple of the guys that in my team turned themselves in, which shocked me. Well, I found out later, marijuana had been easy to detect, heroin was very difficult to detect. So guys that were smoking pot started smoking heroin, they got strung out on heroin, and that's why they turned themselves in because they were hooked on heroin. Yeah. And one of the guys I'll never forget is the the sight of seeing him. His uh, wherever he was, wherever the treatment center was, I saw him walking across our compound, wearing a robe, 
like a seersucker striped white and blue robe or something. <clears throat> and he looked like a skeleton. And I realized he had changed little by little by little until now I saw he was different than the person I remembered because I had seen him change so gradually I hadn't noticed. It was a couple of weeks went by and I saw him. So it may have been that pot was so pervasive that people just didn't give a crap. And they were sitting in their foxholes pot, smoking pot and they figured if I'm going to go, I might as well go high. I, I don't know. That's the only explanation because we were. it wasn't like we were in a rear position with no danger, as I said. Um, it's a good question. I, haven't, I have not quite figured that one out. You, um, uh, of the time that you spent in Vietnam, you know, did you build any strong relationships with individuals that you stayed in touch with today? And who, you know, tell me about no. those people. Ironically, no. I had a call several years after I got home from one of the, um, one of the guys that I served in the, the last part of my tour, he was one of the uh, guys in the Fire Direction Center. Dan LaConte was his name. And he called me and I immediately recognized his voice and I said, Dan LaConte. And he said, John Butler. And we had a great conversation and that's the end of it. I can't even remember the names of, uh, I stayed, we always stayed pretty close to the troop commander's track in the 11th Cap. His name was Mike McCrary. Mike, Mike, I'm sorry, I'll think of it later. He was a West Point graduate, a great guy. Um, I never connected with him after the war. His, his uh, track commander was from Kansas. He and I connected when we were there. I don't remember his name. I, I, I don't, I'm embarrassed to say that. Um, my track commander's name was Frank Yukovich. We call him Yukon, but I've never talked to him since Vietnam. Um, no. Was the, uh, out of curiosity, was the uh, um, uh, 11th Armored Cav uh, Regiment Commander uh, George Patton Jr. when you were there? Not when I was there. I see. Okay. Well, as we wrap up here, uh, we want to thank you, first of all, great stories, great information. Um, and um, I'll ask Sue if you have some, any follow-up questions or anything you'd like to ask. You asked it, and thank you for asking it. Yeah, I was curious about that, too, because kind of the motivations for fighting and fighting for each other has always intrigued me, and I'm really fascinated by the fact that you had such different guys between mm. the two units at basically the same time in country. What's that? At basically the same time Yeah, in and that's, that's the other thing that, yeah. that people, uh, in fact, uh, there's one of our, I won't mention any names, but one of the guys from the VVVA questions about, it was questioning me, why do we need somebody from the outside to explain about the history of Vietnam? I can tell you, I was in two different units at the same time I was there. They were completely different experiences. So do I have the right perspective? Sure. Do I have a complete perspective? Hell no. You know, even if you're there at the same time, it's a different, different, very different perspective. So, um, and I, you know, I didn't intentionally disconnect. I just, it was, uh, I think part of it was I wanted it behind me. So I never, really never pursued it. I've never been to an 11th Armored uh, Cav reunion. I'm thinking about going now, not because I'll meet anybody that I know, probably, but it's just that that unit served so well together. Um, and like I said, it wasn't because we were motivated to be there. We just decided collectively, we're going to do this right while we're here. And I'm, it's kind of impressive, really, looking back on it. Yeah, and I think that's a strong strong indication of the type of leadership that you were exposed to in the two different units could probably. Be. It could be. Well as we wrap up here I ask probably one last question for you. Is there, is there, a, is there a particular message or something you'd like to leave with us yes. related to your experiences and what yes, you talked about? I, I have thought about that even while I was talking. If you can imagine most people think men can only do one thing at a time. Only women can do two things. But somehow it's been resonating with me. Um, and I'll go back to the reason that I went to Vietnam. Um, at, at the time I grew up, it was common, it was common 
to have an extraordinary sense of responsibility and duty, that the world was bigger than me. It is not common today. Um, and this is not preaching. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I want people to know, if anyone hears this, um, I want people to know that there is a sense of deep satisfaction and gratification to do something that has no value to you directly, especially if you can benefit somebody else, to do something for somebody else, whether it's an individual, a group of people, or certainly for our country. You can't explain, you can't really appreciate what that's like until you do it. And when you serve, uh, frankly, I believe God made us that way. I believe God made us to love actively others people we don't even know. And when we do, it resonates deeply within us. Even if we don't think about it, we just do it. It happens because that's how God made us. That's what I believe. And so when you serve for the benefit of somebody else, there is something in you that is so blessed and is, is a deep benefit. Uh, don't do it for that reason, but if you do, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll find out what I'm talking about is true. So that's what I would leave people with. Well, John, we want to thank you uh, very, very much today for your interview and your time with us. Uh, I think your stories and what you, the message you've left here with us is, will stay with a lot of people for a long time. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your service and welcome home. Thank you.